Welcome, and thanks for joining us for another sermon from True Vine Baptist Church and Pastor Josh LaGrange. This week, Pastor Josh continues to lead us through the book of Genesis through chapters 7 and 8 and shows us many of God's truths involving the timing of the events of the flood, questions that we may have or objections the world may have, and the principles that we are to learn in this. You can join us by opening in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, as Pastor Josh LaGrange delivers his sermon titled, Uncreation and Recreation. All right, let's turn our attention to Genesis chapter 8. Let's read, um, let's read God's word, and then, and then we need God's help, and so we're going to stop and ask for it. So Genesis 8, beginning in verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained. And the water receded steadily from the earth and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. In the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven. And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So no one knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove. But she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, and on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark. You and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you, bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. Please bow with me and let's ask for God's help. Oh, our Father, God, our, our minds are tempted to be racing and thinking about dozens of other things at this moment and all the worries of life. And God, we just ask for grace that right now you will give us the help, the strength Lord, to forget everything that doesn't matter and come and seek you. Lord, to do the one thing that matters above everything else. Lord, to know you. And so God, I I pray in this time, Father, help us to just metaphorically leave earth for a bit. Lord, and meet with you. Father, please show us your ways, show us your will, show us your character, show us your plan, show us your glory. Show us the glory of your righteousness, the glory of your wrath, but God, show us the glory of your grace and bring us to praise the glory of your grace that we would be a people who revel, 
who bask, who rejoice in the mercy that we have been shown, O oh God. Please, God, teach us in, in this time. So, Lord, whatever needs to happen, the things we understand and the things that we don't, every grace that we need, Father, please come to us. Your children in the room, I, I beg, O oh God, sanctify us. Make us holy. Bring us to righteousness, O oh Lord. And Father, strengthen our zeal, our confidence in you, our faith. And God, I pray for those in the room that have not yet repented, not yet looked to you for salvation. Please, God, make this the day that they remember throughout their eternity is the day that they were born again. Oh, please, God, show your grace. I need your help so badly, Lord. Please protect what I say, protect my mind, protect my heart, everything that I need, God, help me to teach and be useful, Lord. So please, Lord, in this time, for the glory of your name, help us. And we pray this through Christ. Amen. I, I want to divide um, our study through this section uh, into three parts. So if you're taking notes, um, here will be the three parts that we look at. Uh, very first uh, time we're going to spend is simply walking through the details what happened in these events. Make sure we comprehend them. Try to point out some of the dates uh, that were given here so get the events and the timing straight. Secondly, after we understand what happened, I want to look at some of our questions, historical, scientific, practical questions about a global flood and even some of the objections that you might hear from the world. That's not where the Bible emphasizes Okay? But it is helpful to uh, look at some of the answers to questions and even objections that you may encounter. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time doing that. And then thirdly, at the very end, we're going to draw out the truths and the principles um, that God wants us to see from this section. So a number, uh, a number of truths that God wants us to see and why this has been given to us. So those are the three places we're going. Let's get started with number one and look at the time frame. Look at the events of what happened here. We saw last week back in chapter 6 that God came to Noah and God gave him the general instructions that we saw there. There's a flood coming. Build an ark. He even told him, began to tell him some of the detailed instructions. Built it out of gopher wood. Uh, God gave Noah dimensions of this monstrous vessel. Uh, by the way, I do think it's really cool that you can go visit a place and see a life-size replica of the ark or walk around in that sort of thing. Kind of gives a little bit of a uh, better understanding uh, to see these kinds of things. But here is, here is what God told Noah the dimensions were to be. Your Bible may mention it in cubits. Uh, that's because they did not use English standard in the ancient world, nor the metric system for that, okay? Cubits uh, is, is what is spoken. A cubit equals 18 inches. So when you do the math, this thing was to be 450 feet long. That's a football field and a half. I said that wrong last week, by the way. It slipped out of my mouth. 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. God then gave Noah instructions about how to do it. He told him how to waterproof it with resin, etc. And then here is, here's a great likelihood. There's a great likelihood that God gave Noah a lot more instructions that just aren't recorded here. What we have is a summary. It's very possible that God walked through, uh, walked Moses through even how to do the construction. Similar to how God spoke to Moses about the tabernacle and such, about exactly how to do each part. We're not told exactly when God came to Noah. There's a couple possibilities here. Um, I, I, I lean towards, it looks to me like back in chapter 6, we meet Noah in the 500th year of his life. Um, and some may say some things like, well, that's kind of convenient. 500, or it could be that God chose this on purpose. 500 years into his life, opportunities for repentance and things there. Uh, others think that back in chapter 6, whenever we saw that part that we talked about, that God said he's going to cap man's life at 120 
And we took that to be that uh, unusually long lives uh, before the flood and then after the flood, we see 120 is about the limits that God allows man to live. Some people believe that that 120 referred to God came to Noah at, at like 480 and then it would be 120 years until the flood. I, I lean towards, I think, the fact that God came to him in the 500th year of his life. But at some point here, Noah began construction on this vessel. He and his wife, his three sons and their wives, eight people working on this boat. This boat, when there was no water, and for it looks like a bit over a century. We we jump to the 10th day of the second month in the 600th year of Noah's life when they complete this work. A touch over a century with hand tools and whatever technology was available to them constructing this vessel that was here. To put that in a little bit of perspective, you will probably not live to 100. Can you imagine spending the duration of your life every day but the Sabbath working on this vessel vessel, while the people around you mocked as they saw your progress year after long year of going through these things. And we're told that while this was happening, Noah was preaching to the people. You got you to bear in mind, the people around Noah saw the progress he would be making. Like a couple weeks in, people were probably wondering, Noah, what are you doing? What, what, what is this? By the time you get 50 years in and see the frame of what he's doing, these people thought he was insane. And yet day after day, Noah and his family keep plugging along until finally they come to the end. Even after they come to the end and the ark is constructed, there were other preparations that had to be made. The gathering of grain and food. We're going to see there was a season there where where God brought the animals to Noah. That's one of the questions sometimes people have. Well, how did Noah go around all the earth and find all them animals? He didn't, okay? God, we're told, God brought the animals to Noah. And, you know, when we think about the practical ways that this this comes about, I always find it interesting what the Bible gives us and doesn't give us. So I'm a construction guy. I've got 40 questions about uh, what handles did he use and, you know, which which thing, what did he have available, what technologies were there and things. But, you know, I've kind of wanted to make this point at some point in our study. This is just as good a point as any. We have hundreds of questions from the Bible. And we even a lot of times from certain accounts have stories about um, how did it happen? Historical questions, scientific questions and things. But you know, if God were to let us have the gift of like, if he came to True Vine and be like, you got Michael for 20 minutes, okay? You ask whatever questions you want of the, of the angel Michael. And we started in with this kind of stuff. How old is the earth? Was Noah living on the supercontinent Pangaea when the flood came? Like, if we started in with this kind of stuff, like, don't you know the angel would be like, you're kidding me, right? You give me for 20 minutes. This is the kind of stuff you're asking? Because listen, at the end of the day, those kinds of questions, they don't matter in eternity. Like, I'm not saying there's never a time to have the conversations and ask. Every question you have, seek answers for. The Bible will always hold up to your questions, but we also got to know the priority of truths. Your soul does not need to know if Mount Everest was formed during the flood in order for you to fulfill the life that God has called you to. But you hear me right now. The truths that we are given, you need to know there's a reason why God closed the door behind Noah. And you need to know what a covenant is. And you need to know that our God is a God who makes covenants with men. Every truth that we are shown, that's the stuff that is going to transform you. That's the stuff that your soul does need in order to fulfill this life that he has given us. So ask your questions, seek the answers and things, but but we got to comprehend it in its priority. So a little over a century, the ark is completed, the preparations are made, 
The text says that God brought the animals to Noah, and then God tells Noah, okay, so this day came. God tells Noah, you and your family go inside of the ark on the 10th day of the second month in the 600th year of Noah's life. Noah and his family and the animals walk into the ark, and the door is left open, and Noah and his family stay in the ark for seven days and nothing happens. And just when you maybe were getting to the point where Shem, Ham, and Japheth were asking, Dad, you sure about this? Did you really hear God's voice? Then the flood begins. God shuts the door and then the flood begins. We're going to see there's a couple different ways that this flood comes about. The waters increase. The elevation rises for five months. It rained for the first 40 days and 40 nights. But if you watch the language of the text, for another 110 days, the water levels continue to rise even after the rain has stopped. And the Bible shows that the water levels rose above the tops of the mountains. You, you, need, you need to know this, okay? The Bible shows this to be a global flood. Okay, so, so no like letting off the hook of anything. This is not local. This is not just a, a little bitty area. The Bible shows this to be a global flood that destroyed all life that breathed the breath of air outside of the ark. Outside of the ark, nothing that breathed the air lived. Only what was inside. Well, after the water uh, finally stops rising, uh, we have the abatement and then the, the slow receding that begins to come. We see that God used some natural means in order to bring about the dissipation and evaporation. There's mention of God bringing heavy wind and the sun dissipating and evaporating. The, and then the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. Now, quick side note. You might be interested to learn that there are entire organizations whose sole aim, in fact, there are individuals on this earth whose life mission is to try to find the petrified remains of Noah's Ark. Now, personally, I don't think they're ever going to find anything. Uh, to, uh, wood has, uh, tends to do this certain thing when left out to the conditions. It tends to rot. Okay, nothing be left. But I am kind of happy, I think, that there are organizations who believe the Bible and they go and they do these explorations in the mountains of Ararat, in the Middle East and such. There have been some pretty exciting things that have been discovered along the way. Never found Noah's Ark. Uh, you've probably read that uh, along the way, um, shark's teeth and things have been found at the tops of mountain. These really kind of odd and uncanny things get found at the tops of mountain. And, you know, atheist scientists have their versions of how they believe this sort of thing happened. Us Christians point to this event um, as the moment when these things came about. But we keep going here with the time frame. Eight months into the whole ordeal, and Noah could see the tops of other mountains visible. And the water continues to recede. Now, um, a, a couple things that will help us understand kind of the last part here. God told Noah there was going to be a flood, but God never told Noah how long he was going to be on this ark. God never told Noah every detail of how all of this was going to go down. Noah got to hear God's voice. No, Noah got to experience that the thing that we all wish that we could, to hear God audibly speak. But don't misunderstand to think that like Noah got to just talk with God all day and anytime he wanted to and get every question he had answered. God gave Noah a set of instructions. And, and then watch this. Noah's faith was tested along with this. Noah's endurance, Noah's Patience and perseverance was tested as well. By the time we get to the, the end of all of this, Noah has been in that ark for 378 days. I don't know about you, by the end of that, I'm ready to get out of there. And there is some that Noah did not understand of what was going to be happening. And so there at the end, as you see him trying to find out if the earth has receded and not stepping out there yet, some of this is because Noah didn't understand. Is this the end? 
Is there more that's going to come? He was not to leave until the Lord told him to. So we see that there's a window. They can look out the window, but they can't see what's going on all the way down at the bottom. Now, Mount Ararat, there's some discussion over which section. This is a massive mountain range, okay? Some of the sections of this mountain range are covered in like 10 feet of ice, okay? And so you have some of these sections here and and not sure which part this would be referring to, but the peaks of Mount Ararat sit at 17,000 feet. If you know anything about mountains, that's big, okay? Uh, Denver, Colorado sits at 5,000, okay? So this is way up there. Noah's got a window, but he cannot see all the way down the mountain. Well, if you ever wondered like I have, well, why don't they just open the door? Why not just, why not just walk out? There's a couple possibilities here, but I think the, the indication here is Noah was not to open that door until the Lord gave the word. God shut the door. And it was God's command of when they were to open the door. One of the last things that you'll see Noah do is remove a covering from the top of the ark. It appears that this would have been a covering possibly of skins, some kind of material that acted as a tarp that waterproof the very top section there. Perhaps even the Lord sealed down the last part there. But they were not to just leave until God gave the word. So Noah opens this window. And we see this section here where they're sending out birds. First, they send out a raven. A raven is a carrion creature feeding on dead things. And it is part of the gruesome details of this account. But you don't understand the story unless you consider the gruesome details. A lot of dead things for this raven to feed on. All of animals, and do not forget the fact, all of mankind outside of those who believed the Lord and entered the ark. Next, Noah sends out a dove. The first time he sends out the dove, the dove flies around, finds nothing, no, nowhere to land other than mountains, nowhere, no trees, no place to rest, no place of refuge. And so the dove comes right back. The next time that Noah sends out the dove, it comes back with an olive leaf. By the way, olive trees can grow under a small amount of water. But what this lets Noah know is, okay, we're, we're getting closer. We're progressing here. There is something that is growing. Noah waits another season of time. He sends out the dove again. And this time, the dove never comes back. Meaning... The dove has found a place to rest. The dove has found a place of refuge. Noah then knows we are near. It's drying up. Another season of time, and God finally speaks and says, it is time to come out. All in all, 378 days inside of this ark, or a touch over a year. And every one of the animals, every one of the insects, every one of the birds, they come out of the ark. And when you look at the language of chapter eight, there's supposed to be some bells ringing and reminding us some of the language of Genesis one. God talking about the animals coming out after their kind, this call to be fruitful and multiply. We're shown something here. God uncreates the life which he had made. And Noah, kind of like a new Adam, steps out of the ark, and then God gives this instruction for recreation. You get this picture of uncreation, life destroyed, recreation. This is a new earth. This is a new start. This is destroying the old and then bringing in the new. And if you're thinking, hey, that kind of sounds like what God is doing right now, and then when we come into the new age of the new heavens and the new earth, yeah, yeah. We're supposed to see that. This is a foreshadow of that greater salvation in Christ. This is a picture of the greater work that God is doing. But when God makes the new heavens and the new earth, we're not bringing any of the old sin into this new one. But we do have a first picture here. The moment that Noah and his family step off of the ark, the very first thing that Noah does is construct an altar. By the way, first time in the Bible we see that happen. 
so that he could offer sacrifices to God in worship and in gratitude. Now, a, a question that could be asked is, wait a second here. Um, Noah killed some animals. Um, did he just cause a species to go extinct here? No, if you remember, there were two of each kind of the unclean, but God specifically brought seven of clean animals, animals for sacrifice. And for this purpose, guys, there was an element of faith, even from the very beginning here, of God showing, I will carry you through. I will deliver you through this. And when you come to the other side, when you step out, you will worship me. And Noah and his family offer up worship to God. The Lord smells that soothing aroma and then God meets with Noah again and gives him instructions. And what we'll see two weeks from now, next week being Resurrection Sunday, what we'll see two weeks from now when we come back in chapter nine is looking at what it is that God says to Noah and the covenant that is made. So here's point number two now. We've seen the details. We've seen the events that go down. Point number two, let's consider for just a little bit some of the questions, um, even some of the objections that the world may level. And and I I think that it is helpful, at least at some point in your life, to think through some of these kinds of things. Just as we have questions about creation and and how it matches with what we think about the world, and and listen, the the popular views of of the day, we have questions about how this fits in with how we observe this world. But I, w- I, wanna, I wanna emphasize and repeat this again. Every question has an answer. And I just wanna tell you, it is a regular thing that just keeps happening. It's been happening for 2,000 years now. It keeps happening. The world will have an idea, a popular opinion. Christians will speak up about this popular opinion and will say, I, I don't think I can, I can buy that because of what I see in the Bible. And then here's what happens. The world then mocks believers, speaks to us incredulously like a bunch of imbeciles, and then will say, don't you believe science? That's kind of the new modern thing here. Science. Science. Throw the word science 15 times in a sentence, and then it will sound scientific. But all this is going, but I just just want to tell you, I'm 36, okay? I've been a Christian for two and a half decades now, and I have already seen at least a dozen subjects where there's a popular opinion of the world. Christians did not agree with this popular opinion. We get called imbecile, science, 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 give it a decade. And the popular idea of the culture, maybe a discovery is made, a shift of thinking, and they come back to the biblical point of thinking here. This, this was a big deal in the early days of archeology. span This was a big deal. For a long time, skeptics mocked Christians and called them imbeciles because we believe that the history described in the Old Testament is true. And and the skeptics of the world were constantly, David didn't even exist. Oh, you idiots. We have never found any indication that these Hittites even existed, okay? Lo and behold, archaeology, high five every archaeology, all all just you ever meet, okay? This has been a close friend of the Bible. Slowly, hundreds, this is no joke, hundreds of, of details from the Bible get confirmed. And there's been this total shift of thinking of going from the Bible cannot be trusted to now even some secular universities look to First and Second Samuel as an authentic uh, world history of what went down, okay? Total circle around. But I can tell you what never happened, okay? No news agency ever ran a story of, a, hey, shout out to you Christians. You guys had it the whole time. Sorry, never happened. So many different, so many different subjects, so many different examples of ways that this has gone down. But I tell you all of that to say this. Do not let the world's ideas and pressures bring you to doubt the truthfulness of God's word. God's word has been getting challenged for thousands of years And what keeps happening over and over for those thousands of years is the culture circles back around and the biblical position is shown again and again. Listen, ideas of the world get debunked all the time. 
But the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord endures forever. And I say that because sometimes Christians can cave when met with some objections. All those animals couldn't fit in an ark. Oh, you're probably right. I'll stop believing. Come on, believe, okay? God's word can be challenged, all right? And it's, it's going to stand up every single time that it is there. So there are questions we may have, objections from the world concerning the flood. Let, let, me, let me just bring up a few of them. But let me start by saying this. So even before I get to the questions again, let me start by saying this. W- would it help you to learn? We have identified more than 270 cultures that have a major flood story in their history. 270 cultures in their uh, history, in their mythology, in their religious stories have a, have a major flood as a part of their story. I don't know about you, but I find that compelling. I'm in an ongoing discussion with a skeptic right now and kind of danced around with the subject of the Bible. And I finally tried to narrow him down. Do you believe the Bible is from God? And he came back and he finally said, no. He said, the reason why I do not is because the Bible is similar to other religious stories and, and cultures, mythologies out there. But one of the points I tried to make is, now think about this. If history went down exactly as the Bible said it did, and a global flood then led to a dispersion of all the peoples in the world, which we're going to see in Genesis 11, when we come to the Tower of Babel, don't you think that what we see is exactly what we would expect to see, that these peoples who scattered throughout the earth carried some of the major stories into their, uh, into their oral, t- oral telling and such, into some of their mythologies and religions that they invented. And just as Romans 1 says... Men abandon the truth of God for a lie, but, the, but God has spoken to give us the definitive message of mankind. This is exactly what we would expect for there to be some of these similarities there. More on some of that when we come to Genesis 11. I've got some other things I can't wait to pass along to you there. Let's talk about a couple of the questions. Number one, what about the size of the ark? Could it really have held two of all the animals in the world? You'll often hear people just sort of rattle this off. Well, there's no way that they all could have fit, even without doing the math. But short answer, do the math. It works. Yes, the world has elephants, giraffes, and hippos. I'm confident the Lord brought baby elephants onto the ark. They exist, but the average-sized animal on this planet is smaller than a sheep. And whenever you do the math, there are 18,000 species of animals on the planet today. And even if you double that to allow for extinction since that time, there is more than enough room to fit those animals and even to spare for food. Secondly, we talked about how did Noah go get all those animals? The Lord brought them to Noah. But another question, and this is maybe one of the biggest Is it really possible for it to rain enough to cover the earth, to cover the tops of mountains? Well, just consider a few things here. Number one, did you know that if all of the surface of the earth were leveled, okay, meaning knock down the mountains and fill in the holes, Fill in the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean, okay, level the surface of the earth. If you leveled it all out, that the entire planet would be covered in more than 50 feet of water? This is a planet of water. The land has been gathered up in elevation. The Bible says that it is God who has gathered up the land there. And when you read the text here about the flood, another misunderstanding is it never says that merely the rain is what brought the flood. Jump to chapter 7 again for a second here. Find verse 11. Uh, 7, uh, 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the, watch this, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. When you come to the part where God ends, he's very specific to mention three things. The, The great deeps are no longer bursting open. The floodgates from the sky are no longer pouring 
and the rain stopped. So did you catch that first part there about the great deeps bursting open? Many Christian scientists believe that this may be referring to massive earthquakes, volcanoes occurring uh, in the oceans, um, sending tsunamis onto the land. In fact, many Christian scientists also believe that the flood is what explains a lot about this world. Uh, For instance, both Christian and atheist scientists both agree that all of the land on the planet was once in one location, a supercontinent we call Pangaea. And what both Christian and non-Christian scientists believe is that what broke up this supercontinent was massive shifting of the tectonic plates. Well, many Christian scientists believe that it is the flood that brought this about. There's huge disagreement on the timing. Christian scientists point out the fact that the flood may be the answer to a lot of those complex issues of how old is the earth and how old are fossils and things of this, uh, things along these kinds of lines here. Many Christian scientists believe that this is what set off the ice age. And when you consider these kinds of things, really a global flood makes sense with a lot of these kinds of issues. So sometime for your own research, you may look up Um, that there was recently a scientist from California State University at Northridge. He was fired for discovering soft tissue in T-Rex bones. Now, let me just say this. You do not have to adhere to these perspectives of history and how these sort of things go out. There's a bit of speculation in some of this. But what I do want to tell you is this. When atheists accuse Christians of abandoning science. That's unfounded. And I am very thankful for Christian scientists who devote their life to getting answers and seeing the Bible as a a guide to these things here. And so regardless of where you fall in your conclusions of some of these things, you don't have to believe any of these particulars to be a part of this church. There's latitude in these kinds of things. But I do want you to see there's answers to your questions. And really at the end of the day, We don't know a lot of these, but I am convinced that Jesus is risen and the Bible has been inspired by God. When I talk with skeptics, this is eventually the point that I come to. They'll they'll, they'll vent this frustration about their questions. I'm like, you know, I'm kind of with you. I got questions that just keep me awake at night. But at the end of the day, I'm convinced Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and the Bible has been given by God. And I rest in that as the first place of the truth that I know. The world's ideas change in every decade. The word of God endures forever. If you want to look some more into those things, I want to uh, reference you to an organization called Answers in Genesis and a scientist by the name of uh, Dr. Ken Ham. Uh, I think you will enjoy some of the answers you'll get from those things. All right, let's come now lastly then To point number three, let's try to draw out the truths and the principles um, that God wants us to see in this. So what are we supposed to take? What are we supposed to take out of this? Let me offer nine truths, nine truths to see here. But even before I state them, I want to remind you, we have looked at the three most important last week. The three biggest of the entire flood were these Number one, God hates and is going to judge sin. Number two, God is displaying his glory by saving a people out of judgment. And number three, salvation comes by God's provision. We saw those three points. They are the weightiest in the entire flood account. Let me show you nine more that God wants us to see here. Number one, there will come the day when the door of God's grace is shut. There will come the day when the door of God's grace is shut. Why did God instruct Noah and his family to enter the ark, but then the flood did not begin for another week after that? Friends, what God was doing was one last opportunity for repentance. One last week where men could believe, and even though they had lived wicked lives, they could come and they could be delivered out of this. And friends, we see this in the character of our God all the time. Over and over throughout history, our God has done this. God has planned to send a judgment. 
He does not have to do this next part. But in his mercy, again and again, God will send messengers out to the people, warn them of the wrath to come, and call them and say, there's a way you can be delivered. We're reading in the book of Ezekiel, all of these Old Testament prophets that we read, that's constantly what they're doing. Heralding out, God's judgment is coming, come and be saved. Friends, whenever you think about this, this is what we are doing in this new covenant. This cycle is repeating. In this new covenant, God is saving a remnant of people. God is saving souls. You who are here this morning, I don't know your hearts. Some of you are rejecting Christ. But many of you, what the church family is, is a people that have gathered to Christ. God has saved you, and here's what he's doing. Raising you up, equipping you to send you out to be the Noahs of this world. To be the messengers, the ones who warn of the wrath to come and call to come back to Christ. The cycle is repeating, but it will not repeat forever. The day will come when God shuts the door. We Christians, we are so ready for Christ to return. We groan for it. We long for it. I am so ready to live in a kingdom of joy. But what 2 Peter tells us is that whenever we groan for that and we ask the question, God, why why won't you just do it now? Why won't Jesus come back now? This is what 2 Peter tells us. Every day that God does not come back, that Jesus does not return, that is salvation. The patience of our God is salvation. Every day that God delays, that is more souls entering the ark, more souls entering the kingdom. Christian, aren't you glad that Jesus did not return on the day before you heard the gospel and you repented and turned to Christ? Friends, today is a day of mercy, a day of grace. And I want you to hear me if you have not yet turned to Christ. Today is a day you can walk into salvation. Today is a day when the offer is on the table and God is still inviting, but you need to understand this. The day is going to come when that door is shut. The day is going to come when that offer is taken off of the table. Listen, when the rain started falling in Noah's day, like you gotta know, there were people longing to be inside. I imagine people running I imagine Noah and his family hearing the cries and the screams from inside of people beating and wanting in. Listen, when it's shown, everybody wants salvation then. And you got to know every soul that passes from this earth, when they leave this life and they see the realities of heaven and hell, they all want to be saved then. But they have trampled on the opportunity that God gave them. They have trampled on the grace of God and it is too late. Listen, if you have not yet repented of your sins, turned to Christ, specifically prayed to be saved, you're going to want to one day. But there's grace that comes to you now if you will turn to him here. Listen, if you want to be saved, The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Cry out to him and all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you want this, it is as simple as believe and call out to God and say, I want this. I want to be saved. Please save me. You turn your life over to him and God will save you. You have the opportunity now, but it is a dangerous thing to keep telling God no. It is a dangerous thing to keep refusing The day will come when the door of God's grace is shut. Let me rattle off some more that will go a little quicker. Number two, God never forgets his people. God never forgets his people. Number three, Noah was not spared the difficulty of the flood, but God preserved him through it. Number four, Noah built a boat when there was no water. And that demands faith. See, this is always the issue with everything of faith. Everything of faith is always you're working for something that you do not yet see the reward of. Okay. The always 
faith is about. There's a sense of risk. Um, You all who work hard at ministry and you spend long hours and those late night phone calls and you you give yourself to to ministry and, and labor and effort and sweat and blood and you give yourself to those. You occasionally think to yourself, why am I doing this? Like there's always the temptation to work for what you can see, what's here, money you can spend, rather than working for that which you cannot see. That's that's the risk. Everything of faith is always a bit of a test. If you never feel the risk of that, I want to challenge you. Are you really putting yourself out there to do works of faith? Or are you spending your life only on working on what you can see? Number five, endurance is needed as we wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled. Endurance is needed as we wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled. Uh, The next two, I'm going to mention them, but we're going to come back next week and and pick up on these two again because it fits with chapter nine. But here are the next two. Number six, God works for the praise of the glory of his grace. God works for the praise of the glory of his grace, meaning God saved Noah so that Noah would love and worship him. And that's awesome. God works for the glorifying of his name. Number seven, God delights in the worship of his people. God does not need your worship. He doesn't need you to love him and he doesn't need you to praise him. He is perfectly happy in himself, but he delights in the love of and worship and praise of his people. And then number eight, the New Testament tells us that in this account, there's a picture of baptism, a picture of Christian baptism. Now I have to say that in a place like this because infant baptism is so common, but one of the things that we believe the scripture teaches is that the only legitimate baptism is baptism by what we call immersion of a believer. So someone who has made the decision to turn to Christ, to go under under those waters and be brought back up. You are commanded to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And you are commanded to go be baptized in obedience. We're commanded that whenever we turn to the Lord um, to be saved, we're to tell people. You're never to keep that a secret. We're to show the world And baptism is the way that God has instructed that we show this. And that's why it is a big deal. Well, when we do baptism, baptism pictures several things. I love how when God gives something like this, it's not just one little picture. You got a number of pictures there. Bible says that whenever you go under those waters and you come back up, you've got the picture of washing away your sins. You've got the picture of like Jesus died and rose again. So we go under the waters of death and come back up. But Peter tells us in the New Testament that the flood also gives us a picture of baptism. Noah and his family were engulfed in the waters of the wrath of God and yet were carried through, were saved, were delivered out of those things. You Christian, when you go under those waters of baptism, you're picturing something similar. You're picturing that the wrath of God is all around you and yet God has saved you out of his wrath and brings you into new life. And then the very last one here, very last one, number nine, the dove found a place to rest. We follow the story, and we see this part where Noah is letting the birds go out to see what's going on. And we've got that time there where the last time the dove goes out and it never returns to Noah. Now, for thousands of years, people of God would read that and be like, there's something deeper there. There's got to be. There's just something in the text. It's just like, I know there's more there. Well, lo and behold, Jesus comes to the earth. And at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry, he went to John the Baptist to be baptized. Jesus walks into that water. John the Baptist realizes that this is the Messiah. This is him. The Lord revealed that to him. And John the Baptist starts stuttering around going, I need you to baptize me, not me, you. Jesus says, for the sake of righteousness, let it all be done for now. Jesus is baptized. And then do you remember what happens here? The Holy Spirit descends from heaven 
and comes and rests on Jesus. Jesus at that moment is in a mysterious way that we can't get our minds around, filled with the Holy Spirit in a new way. And he's divine, but the Holy Spirit comes to live with him in his human body. We've got the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit descended from heaven, what did he appear as? A dove. Okay, that's neat. What does it mean? What was the point when Noah sent out the dove? The point was about finding a place of safety. The point was about finding a place of refuge. The dove found the place of rest, the place of rescue, the place of salvation, the place of deliverance. And what we're showing is, friends, that place is Christ. He is your rest. He is your rescue. He is your salvation. When you look to Christ in faith, You are brought near to God. You are brought into the kingdom of God and delivered from the wrath that we deserve. Friends, the New Testament looks back on the flood and says, if God did not spare the ancient world in their rebellion, then he will not spare the present one either. Sin is going to be punished. I don't care how many songs on the radio say otherwise. God is going to deal with sin and his judgment will be fierce. But God has provided a place of salvation and it is in Christ. So you Christians in the room, let's take the account of the flood and let's commit to be Noah's in this world. Preachers of God's message those who herald forth the need to come and be made right with God. And if you are not yet in Christ, the day is going to come when you will long and you may even scream out to get to be in salvation. If you will turn there now, you are brought near to God and delivered out. Look to Christ and be saved. And I just want to give the invitation to you guys. If any of you want to do that, you you can stop right now and pray and be saved within these next 10 seconds. If you want somebody to talk to, that can be very helpful. Let me just give the invitation. Find me after the service. Find Pastor Ben after the service and ask. I just want to ask you a couple more questions. Let us pray with you. Let us show you some more that's in there. You don't need us. All you need is Christ. Look to him and be saved. Let's close in prayer. Oh, Father, we are weak, we are sinful, but you are merciful. Thank you that you have welcomed us near near to you by the blood of your Son. Father, I pray for your children. Encourage us, strengthen us, build us up. Father, transform us into a people who live as salt and light in this earth. And God, any in this room that has still resisted even up until this moment, Please, O oh God, open their eyes. Draw them to you, O oh God. Bring them to bow their wills to you, Lord. Please protect us and be with us. And we ask these things through Christ our Savior. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed Pastor Josh LaGrange's sermon titled Uncreation and Recreation. Tune in next week as Pastor Josh delivers his Resurrection Sunday sermon. True Vine Baptist Church also invites you to like our Facebook page or visit our website at true-vine-baptist.org.